tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend. Always kind of you to stop by Casa de Blood. So, I guess you're expecting me to read to you again? Even with the Shanghai shivers? No, Chester, I'm all out of sick days. Unless you want to take a stab at it. Guess not. All right. Come on in, friend. Enter at your own risk. Or wear a mask. Mmm. Mmm. That's helpful. So tonight we welcome back author David Lieb, who you might remember from Season 3, Episode 8, Salt and Light. So smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. You know... Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. Tonight's tale is about love, sacrifice, and fate. So without further delay, from author David Lieb, I give you the crown of the world. Abigail. It's been a long time since you heard from me, I know that. There's nothing I can say to make up for the way I left, and I know that too. There are a lot of things I need to tell you and a lot of it will be hard for you to hear. And all of it will be hard for me to tell you. I wouldn't blame you if you never even opened this letter. But in the hope that you'll at least get this far, I'll start with the part that really matters. I love you. And I'm sorry. I left you because it was too hard for me to stay. But you deserved a father. And though I was always a poor stand-in for him, I was too much of a coward to admit that you needed me all the same. I should have been there. I know things can't have been easy for you with your mom, especially near the end. I loved her. Maybe not like your dad did, but I loved her all the same. I should have been there for both of you. There's so much about your life that I want to know. So much I want to ask you. But I know that I've lost that right. I sit up at night and wonder, are you alone? Or do you have someone? Do you have a family? Are you happy? I don't deserve to know those things, Abigail, but I wish you all the goodness in the world. And I'm sorry for all the shit and the misery I left behind for you. I know you worry about me. Your mom never let me forget that you worry about me, but I'm okay. I've been staying in the camper these past few months, the same one we used to take out into the woods when you were a kid, just you and me and your mom. Christ, I remember how much you hated that. You were a good kid, though. You'd roll your eyes and complain a little but then you'd find a joy in it like you could find a joy in anything. I think even as a little girl, you could tell how much it meant to your mom and me. There was so much goodness in you, and there still is. Don't ever let that go. That's your dad, your real dad, 
all the way through. I've been thinking about those weekends lately, about waking up to the cold and damp and the smell of pine sap heavy on the air, the mist that seemed to creep in through the cracks of the door and soak us all through. I remember your mom frying you up cheap ham and eggs. I remember the sound of the griddle and always, always the ache in my bones. It was a good ache from crowding on a hard mattress with the two of you, from sitting with our backs to the trees and hiking out until the sun was low. It was all good, the cold and the damp, the hard bed and the bad coffee. I loved it all because I was with the two of you. I was so happy then. So happy you can't imagine. So happy I felt like my heart would burst out of my chest. I can still feel an echo of that now thinking back. And it's the only thing worth anything to me anymore. Stolen moments. Those little stolen moments of what life could have been. It was all that was left to your mom and me. Everything we lost. Everything that happened to us. For a long time, I didn't think I would survive it. I never thought I'd live to be as old as I am today, but I did because of you. It was all worth it. Even the days that it was hard. Even the days that I wish I had died with your dad. It was all worth it for those little stolen moments. Your mom called me once crying. She called me a lot, but I remember that time in particular. She told me through ragged breaths that you thought I left because I didn't love you enough. I pray you don't still believe that, though I know I never did a good job of showing you otherwise. I never knew I could love another person as much as I loved you, so much that it hurts. I never deserved you, Abigail. You are your father's daughter. And when I failed him, I failed you too. I've been seeing your dad in my dreams a lot lately. I always do. Never really stopped, but lately it's been more real, I guess. He's felt closer. Closer than he has since he died. I tried to talk about him as much as I could when you were a kid. Tried to show you pictures tried to give you some idea of the kind of man he was. It was hard for your mom, hard for her to hear about him. She wanted that for you too, to feel like you knew him, but it was hard for her. I don't know if I did enough. When you close your eyes, can you see his face like I can? And when you hold him in your mind's eye and breathe then, can you smell the warm air heavy with his scent? Can you feel him there with you? I didn't do enough. I tried to make him real for you, but I know that I didn't do enough. I hope you know that if he were here, he would tell you the same thing as me. That he loves you, and he's sorry. He doesn't have anything to be sorry about, but he'd be sorry all the same. I see him in my dreams every night like he was in the end. I tried to tell you the things that it was right for you to know, and I know you figured most of the rest out. You always were too smart to keep anything from. I know you're old enough to know it all, and I know that you already know the worst of it. It's important that you know the rest, or at least have the chance to, if that's what you want. I know that you know that I ended your father's life. I let that hang between us for far too long, unspoken but understood. I don't know when you figured it out first, if it was me that gave it away or Ava, but it doesn't matter. Even when you were a kid, I knew that you knew, and you must have had so many questions, and you should have hated me. But you never did. You loved me. And I never deserved it. It should have been your dad with you instead of me. Things would have been better for you that way. And I'm sorry it couldn't be. 
I love you, and I'm sorry. I know that as much as you already know the worst parts of it all, you know the best parts too. You know I loved your mom, and you know that I loved your dad. We grew up together, me and him, in a town that you can't imagine, in a town that shouldn't exist. To say it was cold and hard doesn't do justice to the deep and enduring misery of that place. You have to understand that we were born to it. We didn't know anything else, and even to us it felt unnatural and wrong. The sky was always gray, and the sun was always dim, hidden behind clouds and ash, and there was never a star to be seen at night. The streets were lined with ramshackle houses falling in on themselves, and no man could spare a kind word for any other. And around us was always the mountains that surrounded that place. They rose from foothills just outside of town to ugly, jagged peaks, and seemed to hold us in as well as bars on any window, walls in any prison. I don't know why a place like that exists, how it can shuffle on for so long without collapsing into itself. It was a place of pure bitterness and misery, but when we were kids it was all we knew, the limits of our little world. I lived there with my grandmother and your dad with his father, and I won't waste either of our time on the memory of those small and spiteful people. Suffice it to say that my grandmother was a hard woman, and your dad's dad was worse, and our early days were long and full of sadness, and devoid of love. Still, somehow in that dark and terrible place we found one another. We weren't blood, but me and your dad used to sit out on the cold nights and say that we were brothers, that we were all we had in the world, and we were all we needed. Plenty of times I felt like that time would swallow me up. Plenty of times your dad felt the same. We kept each other alive, though, for many years. Just me and him. We were all we had, and that was okay. I look back sometimes and wonder, was home really that bad? I guess it was. I guess that if I had known then... As that little boy crying out and pounding his fists on the street what it would have cost to leave, I would have made my peace with my home. That's the thing about sacrifice, Abigail. We don't understand what we've got until we give it up. And so we offer it up too readily. We talked about leaving all the time, or I did anyways. I dreamed the impossible dream of walking into the hills one day, just the two of us, away from our homes with nothing but the clothes on our back and with each other. We'd leave behind all the sadness, the guilt and anxiety of a childhood in that place, and carry in our hearts the sense of love and wonder that we dared show only to each other and nothing else. It entertained my little fantasy for a while. But in the end, he'd always bring me back down to earth. You know we can't, he'd say to me as gently as he could. Why, I would ask him, surely showing the desperation that clawed at my heart. Why can't we? You know. And he was right. I did know. I knew why we didn't leave. I knew why no one left. I knew what lived in those hills as well as anyone. I had heard the stories and read the old words. I knew them in my heart and I would seen them in my dreams. I knew what poisoned the town and the hearts of those who lived in it. And I knew what bound me forever to a life in that place. I knew that those hills that rose like razor wire all around us were the domain of the Earth Eaters and they would come for any who wandered too far from home. We grew up in the shadow of those hills, but more than that, we grew up in the shadow of those creatures who loomed so large above us that no light could ever reach. 
Folks said a lot of things about them. Too many things. And many changed with each telling. The old men and women would whisper one thing or another. And somehow we believed them all. They're the old gods from a time before mercy or love. And their hearts were filled with rage. They're the scars of humanity's worst sins made flesh and it is our penance to live beneath them. They were made by men according to the old traditions, and there can be no tradition without pain. In some tellings they were giants, and sometimes they looked like ordinary men and women. Some said their eyes glowed so brightly that they were like spotlights in the night, while others said they had no eyes at all. Some said they could do magic, some said they cut off their own skin in strips and offered it to travelers, and if you ate it, you would gain the sight, but be forever cursed. Some things never changed in the stories, though. They were always evil and always cruel. Their mouths were always caked with mud, and some said they ate only dirt watered with the blood of those who wandered too far from home while others said it was only the sores in their mouths bleeding the mud that ran in their veins. They were cursed and despised, terrible and strong, and they lived in the hills. No one could pass through those hills without entering their domain, and no one did that without being seen by them and being known, and no one known by them was safe. If those hills were the bars of our jail, the earth eaters were the guards, and everyone knew that they showed no mercy to those who tried to escape. I still remember the cold oppression of my grandmother's home. Still remember sitting silently, tears running down my face as she sneered at me and spoke in derision. Go then, she would say. Go into the hills. Let them take you. Let them take you away from me. But you won't. You're too much of a coward. She would tell me, and she was right. I would talk to your father about leaving, and he would tell me that I knew why we wouldn't, and he was right too. There was no joy in my life but your father and no joy in his life but me, and we lived that way for a long time. We didn't live for the promise of a better tomorrow, but for a threat. The threat of what would happen to us if we ever tried to leave. And soon, bit by bit, I felt your father slipping away from me. There was a poison in that place, and after many years it began to do its work on him and I swear it was like he was too good to be made cruel, and so he went to sleep. He would still rise in the morning, still do his father's work. We would still meet, and he would still sit and listen to my dreams of another place, but he was slipping away. I was afraid. I didn't know what to do to help him until one day I didn't need to do anything, because his eyes opened. That day, there was another joy in your father's life. The day he met your mother, Eva. God, Abigail, he loved her so much, so deeply, that it wounded him. He could barely talk about her, could hardly bear to be apart from her. And when he was with her, it was like he could barely look at her face. Even before I met her, I could tell their love was something different. Something deep and powerful. Something terrifying. It was a candle burning at both ends, and it consumed your father, and I knew it. And he knew it too. It didn't matter, though. It was beautiful. There was never a love more pure than the love he had for her, Abigail. And I wish you could have seen it. It hurts to think about your mother. For a long time, I resented her because she wouldn't let me talk to you about your dad so much, because it hurt her just as much to be apart from him. I thought she was robbing you for her own sake, her own comfort, 
and I resented her. And when she, when your mother finally went, it hurt too much to think about. I wasn't strong enough and you didn't hear from me. And I knew that I was guilty of worse than she ever was because I left you alone. I'm sorry. I wish I had been there for you. I wish I had done a lot of things differently. I wish for you to remember your mother, not how she was when she went. Not how she left us. But the way she was when your dad and I first knew her. Your dad, he loved her before I ever met her. He loved her before he ever met her, too. He used to say that, and I believed him. Her face is just warm and light, he told me. She doesn't belong here. He told me that she was special. He told me that she had wrapped her fingers around the threads of the universe and pulled hard until her fingertips had turned black to the knuckle. Still, the universe had yielded before she had, and now she could do things, just little things, but things no one else could do. Your father told me that's how she found him. She said that she had needed someone, that she needed him, and so she wrapped her fingers around those same threads and pulled him towards her, and in doing so, she pulled herself towards him. In a way, by pulling your father to her, she also pulled me, and I met her soon after, and as soon as I did, that was it. From that moment, it was always we three, always three, as if it was meant to be that way. The love she and your dad had was something different, but I loved them too, and they loved me. There wasn't any jealousy or bitterness, no loneliness or hate. There was enough of that in our little town, but for the three of us there was only love, just love. I wish you could have been around then, Abigail. I wish you could remember her the way she was then. I know things got hard for her, real hard before I left, and I know they only got worse after. I know that it's not easy to carry that image of a person and reconcile it with the person they used to be, and I wish I had done more to shield you from that. All I can do is try to remind you of the person that she had been, that you were always able to see even when she wasn't. She was beautiful and strong and mysterious. She could do magic, Abigail. I used to tell you that when you were a little girl, and I think it became a fairy tale for you. But it was true. She could do things, like she said, just little things, but things I couldn't believe. She could make the sun shine out from behind the clouds with a look and make the stars shine for us at night. She could make the creek behind your father's house run upstream, and the trees in the forest would bend to meet her, and the grass in the field would pull upwards for her, delighting at her touch. The magic was a game to us then, a game we barely understood the rules of. She had this little cat she used to let run around her place, and she'd collect up the whiskers she'd drop. They're his little gifts to me, given freely, and they're precious, she told us. She said that she had burned them when she asked for things. She smiled when she explained it to me. Sacrifice. That's what it takes, even if it's something small, and you can have anything. Sacrifice. We didn't think about that part. Didn't think about the fact that asking for something big meant giving something big up. Giving up a part of yourself. God, we were kids. After everything that happened, your mom blamed herself. She was real hard on herself. And she was hard on me. And I was hard on us too, but we were just kids. Somebody hurt us, and we blamed ourselves like kids do. Big things took a big sacrifice, and your mom wanted something big. She wanted out of that shithole, and she wanted that for all of us. 
We all knew it was impossible. We all knew the old stories, but she wanted it just the same, just like I always had, only I was too chicken shit to do anything about it. That was the one thing that me and her could connect on that her and your dad never did. Maybe he understood how lucky we were then to have each other. How much you risk for any real change of substance. We used to sit up late, me and her, and talk about what it would be like to pack up and go. Set out into the hills and never look back, come what may. Your dad would just sit and shake his head at what I know he hoped was just talk. But it couldn't stay talk. Not for long. It started small. The three of us. I remember her saying with a wry smile on her face and without a hint of fear or doubt. We should go into the hills. Just to camp. Just for the night. I still remember that dumb fuck look on your dad's face as he just stared at her. And he spoke before I could. We can't. He told her, just like he always told me. Only when he said it to me, it was said with a sort of finality. With her, it was different, like he was pleading with her. We can't. We can, she replied. They don't come for just anyone. You have to search for them. They don't want just anyone. And we won't go far, just to the foothills. I'll keep us safe, she said with a laugh. But I had believed her. And I looked at your dad and he looked at me. His expression was blank. He said nothing. And she let it go. But soon she asked again and again. And eventually, like he always did for her, your dad relented. We went one night and nothing. It was like she said. No one came for us. And more than that. It was beautiful in those little foothills, just like she said. We didn't go far in, only as far as we could get with your dad's little truck, just high enough above everyone else that we could convince ourselves we were on top of the world. We got drunk and looked at the stars shining more clearly than they ever had in town, more clearly than Eva had ever been able to make them shine. We pitched tents and cooked over an open fire. We convinced ourselves that this was life, not the town we had come from, not the fallen buildings or the cracked streets, but the open sky and the cold wind and the smell of pine needles. Looking back, I try to remember when we started to bring that little handgun. Did he have it that first night? Did he always keep it in his truck? Christ, was it mine? I don't know. It's funny how memory works like that. How I could still remember the little things. The look of peace on her face as the wind swirled around her and the leaves on the trees struggled to pull off their branches to land in her hair. But I can't remember something like that. Whose gun was it? I guess it doesn't matter. We would go to that spot a dozen times and each time felt better than the last. We were travelers for once, on a road that actually led somewhere. I knew as soon as I felt like that for even a moment that it wasn't enough for me. And it really wasn't enough for her either. But it was enough for a while. It was enough until it wasn't. I wasn't lying when I said she pulled on the threads of the universe until her fingertips turned black. Sacrifice. We didn't think about it. I didn't think about it when she lay her blackened hands on your dad's face one night out there in the hills as we looked out onto the dim lights of town and breathed freely and laughed freely and felt like there was something worth living for. It could be like this all the time, she said. I waited for the words I'd heard so many times, the words he had spoken to me all through our childhood. The words that echoed in my head whenever I let myself imagine a life in a different place. You know we can't. I waited for those words. And for some reason on that night, they never came. The silence hung over us for a while until she said it again. It could be like this all the time. 
he replied simply. I know. It was what I had wanted all my life, and now that those words were no longer there to hold me back, I felt fear rising like bile in my throat, and I spoke the words myself. We can't. They'll find us. I know, she said in her fierce and fearless way. Because we'll go looking for them. We three will find them, and they'll teach me how to make it real. She explained to us that she could do magic, little things, but it wasn't enough. She explained that she could paw at the threads of fate, but the Earth Eaters could weave it. She said that her little bit of magic was enough to begin to know them and know that they could give us what we needed, a path to a new life. She said that they would teach those who came to them, but we had to be willing to learn, and that they only worked in threes. Me, him, and her. Always we three. Always. It had to be. She said that's why the universe had brought both of us to her and not just your dad, because she needed us both. She explained that they were nothing to fear, that people were always scared of what they didn't understand, and people were always afraid of power. Well, I was afraid, and I did understand. I knew she was wrong. I knew it was all wrong. I tell myself that, to place the blame on her. Only the truth of it is, I didn't need convincing. The truth of it is, I felt their pull just as strongly as she did, and I was just as powerless to resist. Much as I loved your mom, I hated her for a time. I hated her because I told myself that she convinced us to go. I think she hated herself for that, too. She didn't convince us. We three... Each of us convinced ourselves. We did it because we had no choice, because the threads of fate wrapped tightly around us, though we didn't know it yet. We three, me and him and her, always we three. We left our campsite behind. We left our fire smoldering, and we left the keys in your dad's truck. We brought no food or water. Our shoes weren't fit for hiking, and our clothes weren't fit for the cold. It's good this way, she had told us. It's right. We should be cold, and we should be hungry. Our feet should hurt. It's all sacrifice. We walked for a long time, Abigail. I can't tell you how long we walked. The night grew darker and darker and after a time I started to wonder if we would find anything at all. Maybe after all of it, there was nothing to fear in those hills, a story to keep us homebound. I was angry for a while. Isn't that funny? I was angry that we didn't find them, angry that we were safe because it would have meant it was all a lie, a lie our parents and grandparents had told us to keep us home. More than that, it would have meant that the easy excuse that all the cruelty and sadness of our home was poison spilling from the hills was just that, an excuse. If the people who raised us were all victims too, as hard as it was, I could begin to forgive them. If they were just people being people, I could barely stand it. By the time a cold gray light started to filter through the pines, I had almost given up hope and almost given up all fear. We were on the other side, I thought, and in a way we were. We came to a small clearing then, and Eva stopped. She was the first to see them. Soon enough, your dad and I saw them too, but she was the first. I saw an expression on her face I didn't understand, but that I'll never forget. And then I looked to the far side of that clearing, and the terror of my youth came crashing back to me in sickly waves. It was the Earth Eaters. I knew it in a moment, and everything that had been said about them was true, and everything that wasn't was true enough. There they stood, maybe a dozen of them, 
and though I could barely see their faces, I could make out enough. Some were nude, others close enough with rags hanging from their wiry frames. There was not an ounce of fat on any of them, all sinew and gristle and pale skin tied over jagged bones. They shouldn't have been alive. That was the first thought that crossed my mind. They shouldn't have been alive. I can't really describe the fear of that moment to you, Abigail. There are certain things that your body just reacts to and your mind recoils from because you know if you let it inside, you'll never shake it. It's the image of a loved one mangled, the cries of a dying child, a sound you know in an instant you'll hear as you drift off to sleep for the rest of your life. They were like that, but worse. They scratched at something deep inside of me, and just looking at them I wanted to collapse into myself to make myself nothing so that there was nothing they could hurt or else to turn and run away until my legs gave out. The last flicker of moonlight or else the first rays of the sun filtered through the trees casting strange and arcane shadows across their faces. At first I thought they were covered in bizarre tattoos until I realized that their skin all of their skin was crossed with a thousand scars on their faces and hands, their chests and their legs. Each scar, white and ropey, seemed as if it had been made from a jagged edge, from torn flesh, and almost every one seemed as if it had come from a wound deep enough to kill. They weren't giants, though in my memory they loomed larger than they could really have been. They were men and women, clearly had been once, only so much of what made them human had been burned away. Their skin was pale and sallow, as if they had no blood in their veins, skin that was so thickly scarred that it seemed to be made of leather, and just seemed to hang off their bones. It was as if every ounce of fat had been taken in their offering. Their faces were impassive, yet their eyes were full of rage and sorrow. All of them, all over, were covered in a thick and oily mud. It ran down the corners of their mouths, was matted in their hair, and dried along their open wounds. I tried to look away from them, Abigail. I did. When I close my eyes, I still see them, and I still can't make myself look away. I could see them on the day that you were born, and in every stolen moment of joy in my life with you and your mother, and I could still see them the day I left. I can see them now. I wondered then what sort of terror had to be visited on a person to make them turn into that. They disgust me, Abigail. They always have, and I know that it's right to be disgusted by them that it's right and natural to feel revulsion to everything they are. So much of what made them human was gone, but so much still remained. All the worst and most loathsome parts, all the putrid, oily blackness that we carry in our hearts was smeared across their faces for all the world to see. There was no pretense with them, no hidden truths or softened edges. They simply were what they were, and what they were was ruin. I was afraid, Abigail. I'm not ashamed to say that. Never have been ashamed to be afraid. There are times when being afraid is the right thing. Maybe if I had listened to what my fear was screaming into the void in my chest, maybe if I had run, things could have been different. As much as I was afraid, when I looked at Eva's face, she never faltered. She was strong, and she made us strong. She walked towards them, and in a daze your father and I followed. What else could we do? They weren't giants, but they stood tall against the rising sun, bare-chested and unashamed. They carried a thousand mortal scars, and their eyes were dark, and their faces masks of solemnity, and their mouths were caked in earth. 
It was all up and down their arms and legs, but especially on their face. In some places dried and caking, and in others still wet and oily, but earth all the same. They weren't giants, but as we met them in the middle of that clearing, the three of us and the twelve of them, they may as well have been. We were small then, and they made us feel small. We came to them, and they came to us, and there was silence. There was silence, and I could hear my heart pounding in my chest, and I looked at your dad, and I could see he felt the same. His muscles were tensed, ready to grab your mom, ready to run, just waiting, waiting, waiting. The first among the Earth Eaters stepped forward, and in a moment from a daydream or a fever, he knelt in front of Eva. He held out his arm, and she drew a knife that I hadn't known she had, and she pressed it to his skin. She looked into his eyes, and his face showed no emotion as he nodded, and I thought of all the old stories as she slid the blade into his arm and cut. He didn't move, and mud spilled down his wrist as she cut a thin strip of flesh away, and he didn't move until she drew that strip to herself. She told me later that she hadn't planned any of it. She had hardly known what she was doing, that her hands and arms had worked on their own. She told me she was just as afraid, just as confused as we were as she cut that strip of sallow, filthy flesh away and brought it to her face. She told me she was just as disgusted as we were as she brought it to her mouth and ate it. She told me it was cold and greasy, gritty, bitter and rotten. And as she chewed it, she had to fight an almost impossible urge to retch. A mouthful of mud and rotten meat, she said, like it was a nightmare. Like she couldn't wake up. Your dad and I, we were afraid of her in that moment. And we had every reason to be. Her magic was revealed as something much darker than I had ever understood. And for an instant, our image of her changed. She wasn't the sweet and loving girl we had come to think of as an extension of ourselves, but something unknown and unknowable. Something as cruel and terrible as they were. That was shattered in an instant, though, when she swallowed that bit of flesh. In an instant, the scales fell from her eyes. She looked down at her hands, opened her mouth in a silent scream as remnants of skin and mud dribbled from the corner of her mouth. She began to gag, almost convulse. Your dad ran to help her, but there was nothing either of them could do. Her body fought to bring up the poison inside her, and she retched hard, but it was too late. She had accepted that part of them willingly, and so it was inside of her, and part of her, forever. I stared spellbound as she finally stood shakily and ran from the clearing, and your dad and I followed as fast as we could, never looking back. She collapsed again not far off, her body now racked with convulsions, and your dad just held her head in his lap and stroked her head as she wept. The old story said that eating the flesh of the Earth Eaters could give you the sight, and I believe in that moment she had it. She never spoke about it, never spoke about that moment, and after a time I learned better than to ask. I'll never know how much she saw then. It was just a flash, or if she saw it all, everything that was coming everything that would happen to all of us. I hope for her sake that that's not true. I can't imagine a worse fate than knowing what was coming and knowing you couldn't do anything to stop it. Whatever she saw was enough to reduce her in that moment to a shivering wreck, and I remember screaming at her, at your dad, telling them we had to keep going. I remember your dad screaming at me to give her a minute, just give her a minute. I remember her just screaming into the night.
We cried out there into the nothingness until we were hoarse, and then we were walking, just silence and walking, for all the hours back. I couldn't tell you what was going through my mind then, Abigail, other than the knowledge that we needed to get away from that clearing. We made our way all the way back to our camp, and Eva lay in the tent and slept or else just lay still, and I sat for a while while your dad lay with her. By the time the sun was setting again, he came out and sat with me. We were silent until I asked the only question that really mattered. What happened to her? The question hung for a while in the cold, wet air until he replied, She saw what they needed, what we have to give up to leave. Christ! And that was enough. I trailed off. They need a heart, he said finally. They need one of our hearts. And there it was. A sacrifice. Something big. Something big enough to change all our lives. We shouldn't have come out here, I said. I know. We sat up a while longer and spoke and drank and looked at the stars. Funny enough, I try to remember that night when the dreams get to be too much. I try to go back to that place. I can't imagine what was running through your dad's head, but for me, I was at peace. The cost of leaving was too high, and I saw that, and so there was nothing to be done but to make peace with it. That was okay. We drank and spit in the fire and looked at the stars. And when I went to bed, your dad told me he loved me. We didn't say that much, but I said it back to him then. For all the shit that had happened, all the fear and disappointment, that was the last moment of my life before. Well, before what came next. And it was a good one. This next part, Abigail, this is the hardest part to write. And it will be the hardest part for you, too. The part that I dream about every night. The part I try to keep from you. But the part I accept now that you will need to know. <laughs> I'm telling you because this is my last chance to tell you. And because no one else will be able to. I know it will change how you think of me and how you think of your parents. I don't take that lightly. I'm sorry I never told you before. And even still, I'm sorry I'm telling you now. When next I woke, it was late in the night, long before the sun would rise. And I woke to scratching at my tent and a ragged breathing. And I heard him whisper my name. Christ, Abigail, the way his voice sounded, I'll never forget it. I was calm in that moment. All that had happened in waking up from a deep sleep, I should have been scared. But I wasn't, not then. I lit my gas lantern, and I opened the flap of my tent, and I saw him lying there, clutching his chest and wheezing. I knew what he had done in an instant, Abigail, and in that instant my heart broke. We were foolish. We were all foolish enough to believe that night that they would only demand one sacrifice when we knew they worked in threes. But he had to be the first. They needed him to be first. I saw him lying there, and I saw him clutching his chest and I saw mud and blood oozing from the wound. I knew what he had done. He loved your mother, Abigail. He loved her so much, and their love was so deep and so beautiful. But it was terrifying, too. From the moment they met, it burned too brightly, and from the moment they met, they were running toward their end. Because from the moment your father met your mother, he was going to die for her. 
Will, I had said, understanding all at once. Help me up, he had rasped. Away from Eva before she wakes up. Will. I thought of what it must have felt like for him after I went to sleep that night. I imagine how scared he must have been to face it alone. I propped him up, and we hobbled a ways out to a little cave, a peaceful spot we sometimes like to sit and talk, and I sat him down. Why? I had asked him. Why? You know, was all he said. And I did know. He didn't tell me much that he had sat up for a while, knowing what he was going to do. He told me I couldn't have stopped him. He told me neither of us could have, that it was what he wanted. To give us a chance at another life, it was what he wanted. He did it for us, for me and your mom. But he kept saying that we couldn't have stopped him. He wanted me to believe that, that there wasn't anything I could have done. I knew better even then, but I didn't argue with him. He said he hadn't had to go far from camp, that they had followed us after all, and were waiting in the woods like they knew he was coming. He didn't tell me what it was like, but I imagined them hunched over him, how scared he must have been. I wished I could have been with them. For a long time, I told myself that I wouldn't have even tried to stop them. If only I could have been with them. If only I could have held his hand. If only he didn't have to be alone. I imagined him cutting into him, the pain he must have felt. I imagined him pulling out his heart and his shock when he realized that wasn't the end of it. That wasn't nearly the end of it. I imagine what must have been running through his mind as they packed the wound with oily mud and stitched him up. He never knew about you, Abigail. Never knew your mom was already carrying you. She didn't know it either. I don't know if he would have done what he did. I don't think so, Abigail. I don't think he would have gone into the woods if he knew you were waiting for him. He would have loved you so much. He would be so sorry, Abigail. He doesn't have anything to be sorry for, but he would be sorry all the same. I don't know where that little handgun came from, whose it was, but in that moment somehow he had it. In that moment, we both knew what had to be done. He was strong, too strong to become one of those things, and there was no other way. We had come too far. I know he wanted to say goodbye to your mom. I know she hated me for not getting her, but I think he was afraid that if he saw her again, he wouldn't be able to go. That's why they needed him first, Abigail because he was the only one strong enough to do what they needed him to do. In my dreams, I see him there every night, on his knees, crying, pressing the gun into my hands. Every night, I take it from him, and he presses the barrel to his head. He looks at me, and in the same raspy tone, he tells me, You have to do it. Please. You know you do. And I do know, but I'm torn. It's hell, Abigail, every night. And every night, it's the same. I don't know if it's my cowardice winning out over my strength, or if it's finally finding a way to be strong enough. But my hand drops. I don't pull the trigger. I turn despite his cries and I walk away. That's what I dream every night, Abigail. But that's not what happened. 
What happened on that night? There in the little cave, just far out enough from your mom that she couldn't hear. I shot your daddy in the head. And when he fell, I shot him again. He would have wanted that. He would have wanted to be sure. I killed your dad. And the only consolation I had was that what spilled out of his head was still mostly human. They didn't have him yet, Abigail. Not all the way. Not yet. I stayed there with him for a long time, just holding him. And then I left him there in that place and found your mother back at camp. I heard her before I saw her. Heard her releasing the most terrible, the most animal howl I could imagine. When she saw me, she screamed. Scratched at my face, kicked me, punched me until she collapsed into my arms. She knew. I didn't need to tell her. She already knew. We stayed there for a little while, Abigail, and then we left. We got into your dad's truck and drove. And after a time, we found we were in another place. A place where the road stretched far and flat out ahead of us. We drove and drove until we couldn't see the hills anymore. Until we found a little town in the plains. And we vowed to never turn our eyes to the hills again. Your mom stopped doing magic. She stopped looking for the sight. She told me later that it had never been her that they had felt her pulling on the strands of fate and they had used them to move her like a puppet to bring us all to them. They tried to move her still after that, Abigail, but she wouldn't let herself be moved. She stayed up through the night for the weeks after we left, crying from the pain and exertion, but she wouldn't let them have her. They pulled on her, and she pulled back until her knuckles popped and her blackened fingers twisted and fell from her hands. And then we thought we were free. We thought that was it. We didn't realize how intricately their fingers were woven into that tapestry of fate. Your dad was just the first, but that was how their magic works. One, two, three. The rest you know, Abigail, but let me tell it anyways. After all the shit and misery, let me remember some of the good. You came, and for a while things were so much better. We missed your dad so much, Abigail. You never get over a thing like that. But there you were. This little piece of joy and light in a world full of darkness. After it all, we had made it away from our home. After it all, we had you. I remember when you were just a baby laying on my lap. Everything you were and everything you could be just wrapped up in this little fat bundle on my legs. It was all so fresh then. We almost let the darkness take over our lives, but you pulled us back. You were all joy. We tried living like a family for a while. We did. But the scars that that night left, you just can't let that go. I wish I could have for your sake. I know it was hard with your mom and with me. I know you saw us fight, saw us argue, saw us cry. I know you wondered about so much. And I know I should have told you so much of this a long time ago. It killed your mom in the end. You know that. Whatever happened, however she went, you know she didn't want to leave you. It was still them. We were never free of them. Never free of their pool. From a million miles away. From out in those hills. I remember wondering when I first saw the Earth Eaters what had to be visited on a person to make them turn into something like that. 
And when they finally took your mom, I understood. When we used to take the camper out into the woods near town and sleep under the stars, when you would sit on my lap while I shaved, while you and your mom would wake me up with the smell of breakfast and the sound of your laughter, I let myself believe that you were my little girl. I love you, Abigail, more than I ever loved anything in this world. I wish I could have been him for you. I wish it could have been me that died that day. I wish I would have had the strength to go and see them in that clearing. Only I know in my heart that they wouldn't have taken me. Not yet. They didn't need one sacrifice, but three. And he had to be the first. It's all threes, Abigail. And the hardest parts are done. And the sacrifices have been made. It had to be your dad first. Had to be. And they knew it. They knew he was the one, the only one, who would be brave enough to die for us. It had to be your mom next, and they knew that too. She was the only one of us who loved, loved so deeply with every part of herself that she would die rather than be left behind. Only I don't think they ever realized how strong she was. I don't think they realized how much she would love you. How much she would wring out of this life that was left to us. She was magnificent. And the fact that they took her in the end doesn't change that. It had to be me who stayed behind because I was the only one coward enough to stay alive. I've been changing for years, baby. I can feel it in the way I think. The way I feel. It's all mud. I think back to the first day we saw those things. About how alien they looked. I look in the mirror now, and that's all I see. I realized a long time ago that they aren't made by taking a strong man like your father and by cutting his heart out, packing it with earth. They're made by taking a person like me, a coward, and staining his soul. They're made by starting with a person full of sin, full of weakness and regret, and working on him for years and years and their work is almost over. It's all finally almost over. Leaving you is the only thing that really hurts me anymore, and going back to her is the only ray of hope. All of this started when she pulled on the threads of fate and found the Earth Eaters pulling back harder. When I become one of them, will I be able to wrap my own fingers around those threads? Will I be able to pull on them and still feel her there, wherever she is? Will she know that it's still me? Will she be with your father? Will she tell him that I miss him? That I never stopped loving him? I don't want to leave you, Abigail, but I know that I have to. I can feel my blood run sluggish in my veins. Wake up sometimes covered in cuts and bruises, but no blood. Only thick and oily mud. I see grit beneath my skin and scratch at it until my flesh hangs from my arms. I'm not afraid of any of that, though. I don't regret what I did to your dad because I had no choice. Because the strands of fate that bind us all were being pulled by another. It's not his fate I'm haunted by anymore, Abigail. Not now. At the end. It's your face. It's your mother's. Before I left you the first time, she held me for a long while. She told me that she understood. That she didn't hate me for it. She taught me how to protect myself on long journeys. She didn't like to do that kind of thing anymore but she did it for me. She took off her gloves, dipped what was left of her fingers in the ointments and rubbed them on my head gently. She burned the herbs and made the symbols in salt. I had to do it all myself this time. 
I was alone when I breathed in the acrid smoke. Alone when I said the words. But I saw her face all along. And I didn't forget a step. Because she had taught me. I felt her there with me as I painted my face. Draped my eyes in heavy cloth. And prepared my body for this transformation. I wish I could leave you a grave because it's the only thing worth anything I have left to give. But I can't. Let this curse end with me, Abigail. Live your life away from that place where we were born and fill yourself with joy. There's good in this world. I know that there is good, but I know that it doesn't live in me. Fine, then. Let it end. One, two, three. And that was The Crown of the World by author David Lieb. A good reminder that everything that happens once can never happen again, but everything that happens twice will surely happen a third time. Also a good reminder not to mess around with mystical women. You know the type. A little about the author. David Lieb was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California, and currently resides in the San Francisco Bay Area. He works in engineering and writes short stories focused on self-discovery and the challenges associated with processing trauma and our own darker impulses. He's a fan of psychological horror and surrealism and occasionally branches out into historical fiction, science fiction, and fantasy. Thanks, David. And do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. To hear a premium mad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintellsdarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook. And we're accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to DrewBloodHorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Ten Bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. And grab one for yourself while you're at it. And may the wind be at your back. And may the road rise up to meet you. And if none of that happens, just make the best of it. And go fuck yourself.